John Borthwick is the CEO and founder of Betaworks. It's the company that puts out Bitly, Chartbeat, TweetDeck, all kinds of apps. Let's talk to him. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, where did you grow up? Um, in London. In London, in, in the UK. So I was born there, you know, half, half English, half French. So. Mm -hmm. When you said the beginning, I looked surprised because I was like, wow, that's really the beginning. That is, that, yeah. I, I want to know where you started. So yeah, you were so into computers long. back then? or and I love computers. I mean, we're talking about when I was in high school. We were, you know, we were programming and we were recording on cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first experience with a computer was actually a cassette tape, you know, based uh, computer. And then I went through all these sort of cycles of... You know, Pets, Commodores, all of this stuff, mm -hmm. and then all the way through to early Apple machines and so on. Yeah. So, so was, were you always working in computers, or was this something that was just a hobby at that time? It was mostly, I mean, it was mostly a hobby. I mean, there wasn't much. When I was at school, there wasn't really, um, there was no computer science at high school level, in the UK at least. Um, and, you know, when I got to college, it was, uh, you know, it was starting. But it was, yeah, it was mostly a hobby, sort of mostly as a geek and just sort of like enjoying computers and I'm just trying to understand information, information what, spaces. And then did you, uh, what was your first job actually in the tech realm? So in the tech realm, well, I came out of, I came out of college and I, um, I went to work for a consulting uh, company here in New York uh, and they did a lot of things, uh, they did a lot of, consulting for organizations using big data uh, to try and understand how you could figure out uh, information about products and the like. And it was mm -hmm. sort of an early data, sh it was a very data intensive shop. There was strategic management consultancy, sort of a, the kind like McKinsey or something like that, but they were very data intensive, very quant. And so I learned a lot from them. Um, and I think, I mean, my real, first tech job was the first company I started, which was uh, one of the early, uh, I started two companies almost simultaneously. So one of them was a platform for building art online, and then the second was one of the first local city sites. Mm -hmm. And I started those in 94. 94, wow. Yeah. So for online, that's, that's really early. It was very early. <laughs> yeah, it was very, like, very early. Online didn't hit till later 90s yeah. kind of thing. It was sort of pre-browser. I mean, I remember sort of the, uh, you know, the seminal sort of moment for me with the, with, with the sort of the web browser and, and the web was really uh, in 93, 93, early 94. I had a friend of mine who worked up, uh, who was up at MIT, and he, I went up to see him for the weekend, and he said, come over to the AI lab. There's a computer up there, there was an SGI computer that had a browser on it. And we talked about browsers, but it was, there, there weren't many machines with browsers on them. Right. And he was like, you gotta see this. And I remember we went over to the AI lab and we pulled up a site which was actually the Louvre, um, mm -hmm. the French Art Museum, mm -hmm. it's called Le Web Louvre. And we went around a bunch of other university sites, but I remember when we pulled up this site, there was this guy called Nicolas Pinoche, who had put up sort of like five pictures from the Louvre and uh, on his little website. And it was you know, that to me, I remember driving back from Boston down to Philadelphia and thinking all the way, you know, everything's changed. Hmm. Distribution, user-generated publishing, you know. So you knew that. at that moment in time, you're like, this is going to change everything. Like, I, c I can see it, I know. I believe it was going to change everything. I remember, I remember in October 94, after starting my first company, I, um, I went out for lunch on my own and there was a, uh, I, I had a copy of Wine Magazine. And in the body of Wine Magazine, not in the cover, but in the body, there was an article I flipped through that said the next revolution has begun, the World Wide Web. And I remember sitting there reading it and we'd been at work for maybe four or five months. And I remember like having sweaty palms, like, oh my God, this is, it's now out in the open. Right. <laughs> it's like, right. everybody's gonna jump in. It is, um, it's gonna be over in a year. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think I've, I, I think I fairly consistently distort time horizons 
And did you go after like domains at that point in time? Because I remember when I was around that same time, I started to look at domains online. My, it was more like 95 for me, later 95. And they were just too expensive so, for me at the time. I'm like, I'm not paying this per uh, year, but I could have gotten so many good domains. So I had, um, I had a stream of people, sort of friends of friends and friends of friends, who for about six months would come by my apartment to see the web. Um, because there was a, there was an early internet ISP here in New York. There was Panics, and then there was another one which called the Pipe or something like He's, that. Pipeline. Wait, did you say Pair? Panics. Oh, Panics. Okay. P N I X. It was one of the early ISPs here okay. in the city, and then there was the Pipe um, or something like that. And so I'd have people who come by the apartment, and they would um, I'd show them the web, and I never got into the domain business, but it, a bunch of these friends said, "Well, can I buy an address?" So I bought domains for friends of mine, so like big domains, like weddings.com and style.com. Wow. So style.com was bought by a friend of mine who um, he's, he's actually he's a doctor, he's a brain surgeon, and he bought style.com. And then... Like registered it, like I registered one. for it. I got it done. <laughs> I got it all set. And then when I sold my company to... It was part of... It was one of the assets of the company. It was just listed there. And, he, he became an investor in my first company. So then when we sold to AOL in 97, I, um, I called him up and I said, you gotta take this because if it's your asset, it's yours. Um, and you gotta, uh, you gotta maintain it from here on in. So I did the, we did the paperwork. He didn't renew it. Oh my God. So, and then my buddy who I bought weddings.com for, he, he called me up one day, like five years later and said, you know, this guy just came by, will just email me, and I just sold him weddings.com for $200,000. And I was like, you owe me a nice dinner. Seriously. <laughs> wow. So, so I registered, I mean, think be I registered domains, yeah, I registered a lot of domains for people. Um, so so you, you said there that you had sold your company to AOL. Yeah. Uh, how long had you had that company, and how so big that did was that grow? The, so that was the first company I started, which was, um, it, we were not dissimilar to Betaworks. We were sort of a collection of companies. And so we had you know, sort of the anchor site that most people knew was one of the first city sites, which is called Toll New York. Mm -hmm. um, and AOL acquired us really because they wanted a local, they were starting to build out local sites. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we took over and I ran AOL's local uh, product uh, uh, for a bit. So. But as part of that company, we had two other sites. We had the art site, mm -hmm. um, which we ended up donating to the Walker Art Museum. And that, you know, we had built out art projects with, um, uh, with uh, contemporary and, con uh, and conceptual artists on the web, actual uh, artworks on the web. And that was called Artaweb. Uh, and then there was another one called Spanker, um, which was a little bit like, you remember Suck? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a pre-sock sock, sock hmm. sock.com, another good domain. So Spanker, um, Spanker told New York Art Web, we're part of a family of companies or, or products under one company mm -hmm. and they all acquired all of it. But they really acquired it because of the local thing. Gotcha. And so what did you do after that? So I stayed at AOL for a bit. I ended up running new, new product development at AOL. Um, you know, I got on board at AOL. I thought I would stay there for uh, six months and then move on, but I got on board just as you know the AOL and the web and everything was just exploding. So it was a it was an exciting time to be there. Um, I ended up moving to Time Warner and I ended up uh, running tech at uh, corporate at Time Warner. Um, you know Time Warner, massive media company. I had a small team up at corporate and we were in charge of sort of technology strategy. It was um, fascinating, quite a ride, uh, very hard to get much done, but I learned a lot about a lot of businesses, content businesses, TV businesses, cable systems, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And then I jumped out of that and got back into startup um, and s set up Betaworks about four years ago. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about Betaworks. I mean, we've, we've heard about your, your products, but like how did, how did the actual initial company 
How was that put together and why did you, why did you create it? So Andy and I, when we started out, when we started talking about Betaworks, maybe four and a half years ago, almost five years ago, we started, we spent almost a year talking about structure and talking about how we could build a sort of company of companies or a you know, company that, a holding company, a company that creates other companies. And so um, we, we looked at creating, we looked at a lot of alternative structures. We ended up creating Betaworks as a holding company where we do two things, is that we build things and we do seed investing. Mm -hmm. So, and we do all of that off our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So we're not a fund, we're an actual company. And we do those, so there's a lot of sort of disparate thoughts here that sort of all collided, all came together into the entity and why we did it this way. So one thing is, is that we believe that there was a whole new wave of innovation that was taking place online. Mm -hmm. And that would be characterized by by social real time. So the, the social was gonna redefine the way people discovered stuff online. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of, so was this sort of theme, sort of, and we believe that that was a 10 year, sort of 10, 15 year shift that was mm -hmm. just starting four years ago. And so we could create a new company that was optimal for that new world and would be, take advantage of that and build companies in that space. The second thing is, is that we saw that more and more sites were beginning to um, uh, beginning to abstract themselves and be available both as sites, but as also as web services and as APIs. Mm -hmm. And so as data was moving laterally across the web, site to site, machine to machine, we said, we want to actually promote that growth. And the normal structure of companies and of VCs is that they look for like one winner and what we wanted to is we wanted to create a collection of companies that all of them had some uh, participation in this new emerging web. Call it you know, Web 3.0, the next layer of the web, the social web, I don't care what you call it. But mm -hmm. the idea was that there was this next layer of innovation that was happening. And that next layer would look like a loosely coupled set of companies. So could we create Betaworks as a mirror image of that? Right? So do they have to, do the companies have to have I mean, I, with some of the properties that I see that you own today, I mean, they are loosely tied together in one way yeah. or another. They yeah. can kind of help each other. And, and, and is, is, was that a kind of a requirement of a new company that you, you launched? So it's not a requirement. It's sort of the, it, it's, it's, it's organic and it happens through, um, you know, what I refer to sometimes as, as enlightened self-interest. So, you know, at Time Warner, I saw a lot of, a, a lot of top-down attempts at synergy. In other words, big corporates saying to divisions, you know, you will do this with so-and-so. And, -so. and I, I think that the world is too complicated, too complex a place for any top-down architecture to work. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to create here was a lightweight structure and a bottom-up architecture. And so there's, a, there's some Betaworks companies who are fabulous companies who are doing great stuff in their particular vertical, mm -hmm. but they never actually, they've never produced an API, they don't share a lot of data, they're kind of silos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm a little bit disappointed, mm -hmm. um, but I know that, I know a couple of things. First of all is that when you show up and you invest in somebody's company, you're giving them money, so they're probably likely to say within reason anything that you want them to say. Like if I say to you, will you have an API? Sure, I'll have an API. You don't really know what it is maybe at the outset, and you don't really know why you'd want it. And if it's not in your DNA, it's very hard to filter for that upfront mm -hmm. in the investment process. So, so I, would, I would consider we've got sort of these light filters that we try and design for. We try and give people explicit advantages to data sharing and to opening up APIs and to moving data laterally across the Betaworks companies. Um, but we can't mandate it. Mm -hmm. And in the end, uh, you know, these companies are gonna build out what they, and the CEO is gonna build out what they think to be the best, mm -hmm. best in their own self-interest. So do you see yourself as, um as an advisor to these companies? I mean, you're looking for strong entrepreneurs to run their own startup inside of your org, right? You give them, what do you provide them? Is it, is it you know, advisory stuff? Is it office space? Is it you know, so all have, the above? Okay, so we have two, we have two very 
very distinct ways which we engage with companies is that we build stuff, you have Betaworks, and then we invest, right? And which I love, which is very, very, very rare. And, and I'm, that's coming from the Valley. Right. Like, I don't know of really anybody. I mean, there's the Y Combinators, but, but... But people say it's rare, but invariably the CEOs, and particularly product people, are doing it themselves, right? So right. I assume you're still doing angel investing, sure. yeah. right? Uh -huh. And why do you... I, I, I would guess that you're doing that be, because more than you think it's going to make money. Right. I mean, I enjoy, for me, it, it's, it's fun to sit down with an entrepreneur, talk about their business, which is something oftentimes completely different than what you're working on, right? Right. Uh, give them advice, what you hope is advice. They take away the 10 ideas that you give them and they maybe implement one or two, right? right? And then you get to see a little bit of your ideas live on in another product, right? right? Or hopefully bring to them some experience, some way that you screwed up in the past and make sure that they don't repeat the same mistakes. Right. So that, that is essentially what we're, if we're institutionalizing anything, it's that. Mm -hmm. and, and I would also say, I'm mean, use the term fun. I would also argue that you're probably a better entrepreneur for it too. Absolutely. I know I'm a better I'm entrepreneur. learning from them at the same time, yeah. absolutely. And so, you know, when I was up at Time Warner, I remember, um, you know, I, at some point, I, I became an officer of the company and they stopped me from doing seed investing. And I, I, I had long discussions with like the compliance office about this and stuff. But I was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a dumber person for this. Mm -hmm. Because the way that I learn is by working with other people, by understanding innovation out there, by talking to people. Mm -hmm. So, Betaworks, two things. We build stuff. When we build stuff, it is usually, invariably, it is stuff that we come up with, mm -hmm. right? Because we're focused on this space everything on social real time. We find white space opportunities because usually we've got a problem that we need fixing. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're sort of lazy at heart. So the first thing we do is we say, has anybody else fixed that problem? Maybe we can find a company to invest in that's fixed that problem. Mm -hmm. If they haven't, then we'll build something. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, stuff we build. The second piece is stuff we invest in. And stuff we invest in fits the theme um, we are seed investors, so one, one fifty, two hundred thousand dollars first money in. We will to a company look pretty much like an angel investor. Mm -hmm. We don't take board seats. We have some s services at BetaWorks, which we work with all of the companies in the BetaWorks network, about thirty-five companies, and provide them. We do a monthly uh, thing called the Brown Bag Lunch. We do an annual event. We have, um, so we have some email list serves. We have some sort of very light, loose, and highly scalable interfaces into Betaworks that everybody can have access to. Mm -hmm. And then we have the companies who are actually in the office and who are here, which companies we build, mm -hmm. which we're actually building those companies and nurturing them. And I'm usually, I'm usually CEO of those companies for the first 18 months of their existence. And then, somebody else, the person who sort of nurtured and grown up uh, as what we usually call general manager, mm -hmm. then will become CEO of the time or mm. we bring in somebody outside. Why do, you, why do you step in as CEO? Is that a tough transition? I mean, is it hard? You know, I, 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 um, I, was, I was like CEO of Dig for the first four months, brought in a CEO for three years, three and a half years, and then found a replacement those were all very difficult things and decisions to make along the way. Like, is, it, is there clearly a front runner that's already in the company? They're like, you are the GM now. You're going to just run and, and do all the, the hard, heavy lifting right now in execution, and then you come in as a CEO later? I mean, is that the understanding when you go in as CEO? So, or? so um, a couple of, couple of different answers. The first I would say is that generally when we start things up is that the team is a technical team. And so, and, and I think that... First time entrepreneurs kind of, or? Um, usually first time entrepreneurs. Um, although, uh, some of them have worked at, at startups before, but it's the first time usually that they've actually been involved in something from the ground floor. Mm -hmm. So, the, um, 
you know, I would say, I mean, n none of these things are completely typical, but a prototypical Betaworks company that we've built is up to, you know, five people. There's still no business in there. There's no GM in there. There's basically a technical team. And then somewhere around there, somewhere between five, 10 to 15 people, having the, the, this sort of general manager role and the general manager does everything from sales to BD to you know, sort of management is, um, is how we've grown things up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when companies hit like 20, 25 people, at that point they really need their own CEO and they're sort of, they've, they've, they've left the nest and they've kind of grown up. Mm -hmm. So Bitly, for example, uh, we brought in a CEO about uh, four months ago mm -hmm. into Bitly. Um, outside person or someone that had been working at the company? Actually an outside person. Okay. And the transition wasn't that, um, it wasn't that dislocating for the team because I, me exiting as CEO, I was, uh, I'm chairman now over there, so I still, I'm still sort of there and had some presence. Um, but uh, the day-to-day -day CEOs are much more active than mm -hmm. I could be. And, and when you say there and have some presence, you could literally walk to their office in like yeah. 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're right here. Right. But, but I, you know, I think that we've, I mean, Bitly's a good case in point is that I, I realized after we brought in the CEO, I probably should have done that six months before. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a lot of, you know, the, the founders of Bitly, there's like four of us who were there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it was myself and Andy, a group of engineers, and we all sort of, we had the emotional attachment that you would, you know, that you have as entrepreneurs yeah, baby, to something. Yeah. It's, it was ours. So when I started looking for the CEO, I started looking for a COO because I was kind of wimping out on um, giving the reins, mm -hmm. giving, giving all of the reins. And then we found somebody who I thought was the right person. I was like, you know what, this person should be CEO. They shouldn't be, I shouldn't dick around here mm -hmm. and pretend that they're COO. So talk to me about Bitly as a, as a business because, um, you know, in the first, I mean, you, you, you've, you, you launched, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you launched URL shortening. All of a sudden I saw integration to a variety of different you know, third-party Twitter applications. Twitter implemented you for a while and then went back to their own homebrew system. Has that been a little bit of a roller coaster ride? And where, as a business, where, where do you stand today? So, okay, so stepping back, just sort of a picture from Betaworks level. So there's three companies now that I refer to as at scale at Betaworks. Bitly, Choppy, and Social Flow. And then there's a bunch of new stuff, really small companies. Mm -hmm. um, so Bitly it was, uh, is, was the company, is the company that is uh, the oldest incubation thing we've done at Betaworks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about 25 people there. And um, Bitly started out as solving a very simple problem, um, namely shortening URLs um, on the micro-messaging, micro-blogging platforms, namely really started out on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So it sort of bootstrapped itself on that one platform. Um, a bit, so lots of, lots of stuff in between, but Bitly today is, it does a lot more than URL shortening and um, a huge chunk of it is outside of Twitter. Uh, but the journey through that has been you know, both fascinating, um, fun, exciting, uh, frustrating. Uh, it, it, it's it's it has been um, it's been what every startup is, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly because, I mean, t in today's world, and if if you view the world, if you, since our thesis is that the world is these loosely coupled systems, that you cannot control all these platforms, but you participate in them. Um, I th I think that these new platforms offer incredible. They're offering startups the ability to bootstrap and to get to scale very fast. But then what you need to do as a business is you need to learn how to sort of uh, not have single platform dependency. Mm -hmm. Do you and feel you so, got a little bit too far on the Twitter, Twitter bandwagon with Bitly? Or no, there was really no other choice though, right? I mean, tw Twitter was the big URL shortener forever. They still are really, right? Yeah, now. although, you know, so, so we started off as the, um, we created it was created in typical Betaworks fashion is we were working on about four other things. And one of those things needed a URL shortener. Mm -hmm. 
that had an open API mm -hmm. and that worked at scale. And most of the URL shorteners out there at that point, it was pretty much a cottage industry, didn't have APIs or, or couldn't scale. Right. Most of them couldn't scale. So we said, Tiny okay, URL, we can, and we can build one. one, right? Yeah. So we built it and we launched it and we thought that it would kind of be a web service that we would just let run here in the background. Mm -hmm. And it turned into this monster. It just kept on growing and growing and growing. So we provided, the first thing is we offered real-time analytics so you could actually see the click stream. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a sort of very powerful, important piece of Bitly that um, opened up beyond URL shortly. Then we offered white label mm -hmm. um, uh, services. So today there's uh, a little bit less than 15,000, about 14,000 white label mm -hmm. um, users. So most of the URLs that Bitly is shortening on the micro um, messaging platforms today are actually white labeled. So you see an Amazon URL, you see New York Times, you see the US government, you see CNN, ABC. TechCrunch. Uh, P. Diddy, yeah. Diddy yet, right? Um, I need to get my own. Yeah, you can, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, it is, um, all of those are powered by Bitly. That's awesome. And so it's kind of, we moved inside. So Bitly today is sort of the data stack around links. And in the social web, the movement of links, the data around links is really important. Bitly's growth has not let up. Throughout all of the you know, sort of you know, perception that the Twitter ecosystem's changing and that um, Bitly's gonna get screwed by this, by that, um, it's just continued to grow. Mm -hmm. The thing is a monster, it's a quiet monster. Yeah. And, um, and it's a data business, which yeah. I didn't really understand when we started. That, that's my biggest question for you, because I mean, I get that the data is valuable. I mean, to social news sites, to you name it, like it's, it's awesome data to have, but where, how and when do you monetize that? So, um, so Bitly's been, Bitly and the team have been very conservative about monetizing that um, to date. And about six months ago, they started doing some deals um, where we could monetize it in what we felt was completely appropriate with these housekeeping and sort of rules of the road that we had with our users. Um, you know, just to put a fine point on this, is that there were a lot of ad companies who came by. I mean, we're in New York and there's a lot of when you talk tech here, you can hardly get away from ad tech, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of ad tech companies who came by and wanted to buy Bitly data, and we weren't interested in working with them. We wanted to, um, mostly because we didn't know what would happen to the data after we did something with them. And so, um, so that was the sort of the root of the conservatism and the fact that we were just a very fast growing young company and you just, you gotta keep the wheels on the bus and mm -hmm. keep it growing. Um, so in the last six months, the Bitly team has done a series of deals uh, and has started to work with people um, on, in terms of using its data set. So um, one area is that in the social news space. So as you can imagine, since you're seeing the immediate click stream of everything that's happening now, mm -hmm. you know, the Bitly guys, we actually did a product to illustrate that, the news.me product, mm -hmm. which is an iPad-based product to do social news discovery. and it's all of the surfacing of, of stories in that is done through the Bitly click stream. So there's other third parties that we're working with to give them access to the data to be able to do things like that. Mm -hmm. and those are feeds um, that you license out there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's, um, there's some big search um, companies who uh, are interested in the data um, uh, from a sort of search signal perspective. Mm -hmm. And so um, Bitly's been working on that. Um, and then there's a couple of other companies. Um, there's one company that we did a deal with, which is, hasn't been announced, but is, a, um, is more of an infrastructure provider um, to do with, um, uh, and they, they wanted access to Bitly data because they wanted to understand how a lot of these exotic short domains, um, which country codes were actually getting uh, and gaining traction. Mm. And so, it's, there's a lot of people who, yeah, there's a lot of unexpected uses of yeah. the data set. Yeah, it seems that licensing it makes, makes I mean, a lot of sense. We've had hedge funds who've wanted to license it. It's like, so they detect you know, trends and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. amazing. So I, I'm a huge fan of everything that you've built here and, and by Thank far you. My, my favorite shop in, in New York. Um, there's going to be a lot of would-be entrepreneurs watching the show. Um, you know, how does someone pitch you? If, they wanna, if they're like, you hey, know, I'm New York based, I have a couple of different ideas, I wanna launch something. 
is it something where you go to them or do you have a, a forum for people to come to? Like, how does that work? So we, you know, if people, um, uh, the normal sort of outside interface for people coming to Betaworks is that they come in and they pitch us a startup. Mm -hmm. And so, so just go to your betaworks.com kind of thing and, yeah, and, and email us or just email from there. E email us and say, I got a startup I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, so we want to see a beta. So we're sort of um, uh, allergic to PowerPoint. Um, I'm the same way. Yeah. Every time someone emails me and they're like, I have this great idea, I'm like, great, where's the, where's the site? Where's the idea? Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. totally. Yeah. So um, it's the distance between an abstracted view of an idea and the real idea is it's a long journey off. Right. Right? Yeah. And so you could scroll anything. If anything's going to be scrolled, I much prefer to see a napkin because at least it's raw and you see the sort of nuance of an idea. Mm -hmm. When anything gets into PowerPoint, to me, it's like packaging and it's overly processed. Right. It's or kind of like Twinkies. It's a 15 page. Yeah, yeah like a 15 page like Word doc and you're like, yeah. really? Come yeah. on. I yeah. So anyway, so got to have a beta. Yeah. Uh, so we want to see beta. doesn't necessarily need to be a public beta. It could be private. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's uh, seeing the workflow understanding what people are, what, what you're trying to, what's the workflow that you're trying to engage in and what's the product you're trying to create. That's mm -hmm. the center of what we do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's how most people engage with us. They ping, you know, Andy or I and say, hey, we'd love to talk to you about an investment in this new thing we're building. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, um, another thing we do at the end of the show is I always like to ask, you know, what are your top tips for would-be entrepreneurs? Like things that you've seen in companies where you're like, gosh, you, you guys should really do this differently or like what's, what's some of the things, mistakes that you've made in the past that you would definitely want, like to pass on to other people? Anything that stands out? Yeah, so um, uh, a lot of things. I mean, I think that um, okay, so let me try like, try like three, maybe I'll get to five. Okay, so number one is that get to market, get, get your product in front of users as fast as possible. Um, How's that changed with mobile development? I'm curious your take on this. Uh, it's, it's Does really it have hard. to be more baked than, than uh, like It's a really hard with iOS, right? I mean, um, and, and I feel like all the learning that we had with Agile and sort of you know, the <laughs> compressed development process is now being sort of fragmented or unlearned with, with iOS development. Mm -hmm. And, and it's problematic from, I would say, from three vantage points. First of all is that it's a specialized skill. And so I love the fact that with, with web development, you can have one, one person essentially hack up an idea. Mm -hmm. And there's no, like, there's no impotent, there's, there's no like, friction between that one person, between the idea and between the, them ability to actually turn the code into a sort of a beta of that idea. Whereas with iOS, it's hard. That, that is hard to do. You need the semblance of a team. Um, I would say secondly is that the store process and the, um, uh, the submission process mm -hmm. um, is making the whole beta process really hard. Mm -hmm. What's making the trial process really hard. That said is I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing people actually iterating on, um, you've seen a couple of people well-funded iOS startups push out version one of the product and it hasn't really taken and then they've actually gone back and they've taken some of the base code sort of reconceptualized it and pushed out a second version of the product under a completely different brand yeah you almost have to and I think that now we're gonna s and that studio model I mean, we sometimes refer to Betaworks as a studio, but that studio model is, I think, the way we're going to see a lot of this development yeah. happen. So my take on that is that you kind of, you know, you're fighting for this, this whatever it is, 30 icons on the home screen of someone's iOS device, right? right? And it's like you launch something and you have one shot with that consumer. Like they're, they're going to play with it for a few minutes. They're going to say like, ah, I like this or I don't. They're probably going to, if they uninstall it, it's game over, right? For them to go back and say, I heard about a version 2.0 that came out. Now I'm going to go refine the application, reinstall it and try it again. Right. So it's almost like if you don't get it in the first go on iOS, you almost need to take that code back in, reconfigure it, change the name and launch it as a new app. Would you right. agree with that then? Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, um, 
it is, you know, some, some, some particular brands um, are much more adept to reuse, but I would say absolutely. I mean, the other piece of it, which, is, which I'm fascinated by, we talked about Bitly earlier, right? Um, most of Bitly is an API business, right? So as we built out the team at Bitly, as, we've, as we hired front-end developers for Bitly's website, mm -hmm. the UI team for Bitly, I've always had to remind people and go back and say, you know, the website's really important, but 80% of the traffic is through the API. Mm -hmm. And so how are you thinking about designing your product as an API? So because in essence, what's happening with the studio model is that companies are being designed as, as API. So you, wanna, so you wanna actually think of the presentation layer as something that you can detach and throw mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. and start a game with version two mm -hmm. and then version three and you see this sort of separation between data and presentation there. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and create your organization to do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of emotionally, because people get really emotionally tied to brands. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we, we came to this company to do X, Y, Z. And, um, and I, so I think that the, to being able to recycle the front end is gonna be a skill which, I mean, people, uh, pivots become, part of our vocabulary and that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Because the world needs to pivot more. So going back to other things yeah. quickly. So um, uh, I would say uh, instrument heavily. So understanding that user flow, that workflow really well up front is, is also is so important and it's hard to do. Because you usually arrive at a problem with your own bias on how people are going to use it. Mm -hmm. And yet you have no idea really how people are going to use it. So, mm -hmm. um, so we had a launch last week with Chartbeat of um, a new version of their product. Uh, so Chartbeat is doing uh, real-time analytics. Mm -hmm. It's sort of this dashboard for uh, people's sites. So Chartbeat is like packed full of lessons. So lesson number one was we started Chartbeat as a consumer-facing site. And we completely pivoted Chartbeat itself into being this monitoring service. So in of itself, it was a pivot. Secondly is, is that the reason why we pivoted because we thought for Betaworks companies, we want to actually offer really good instrumentation mm -hmm. so that the entrepreneurs and ourselves included would know what's working and what's not working. Mm -hmm. So we use Chartbeat fanatically when we launch services. We use Twitter fanatically when we launch services. Surmise, you know, Twitter search, mm -hmm. um, was very much sort of our, our thinking about how, um, and our involvement there was very much about how you could actually track a new product launch, right? So we've, we've helped architects build, um, invest in tools around the process of building shit, right? mm -hmm. if that's not too sort that's of circular awesome. matter. So um, nice to have that backbone like you can yes, go to. Right. And all these products are available out there for free, right? So Bitly is in the same way as a, it's people use for, they embed Bitly links left, mm -hmm. right, and center to be able to understand how people are using their site. But with Chartbeat, um, uh, you know, we, we went through a big learning there after we pivoted it, after we decided we were going to turn it into this instrumentation platform, we completely misread the market for the product. We thought, I thought that we could have a self-service product where we could go out and we could sell for 9.95 sort of distributed lightweight real-time analytics to your mm -hmm. site. And that's certainly become a popular product. But the most, po the, the biggest users of Chartbeat have been heavy news organizations. Hmm. Uh, or heavy, big news organizations. Because they want to see which stories are trending yeah. in real time? Yeah. So we have practically every major news organization today is using Chartbeat. So about six months ago, we decided to build a specialized product for them, which we launched last week, which is called Newsbeat, and which we could price and sell as a specialized thing. So now we have Chartbeat as the umbrella product. Mm -hmm. Going back to your example of, well, if you take product one and you need to iterate it because it doesn't work and you need to, re you need to rebrand it, here we sort of had the opposite problem. Product one was successful, mm -hmm. but it was successful at a, price, at a low price point, mm -hmm. and we suddenly had people paying us much more money than we expected using product one. Mm -hmm. so, but that's to a certain segment of, of yeah. certain demographic of people. Yes, right. so we segmented. So we started yeah. off with, so we, we launched Chart, uh, Newsbeat, and now we're gonna do Shopbeat, mm -hmm. and there'll probably be some other versions. Does Newsbeat allow the news sites to rearrange the content in real time based on the popularity? 
So yes, so you get to see, you can't actually change the CMS, right? You can't. But, well, they but could, they right? Can, if they, yeah, they can. Right? That's but awesome. In, in the dashboard, you can, yes, it is, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So if something is like, just has a little bit of presence but starts gaining traction, they can just decide to yeah. automatically promote that to the top. Yeah, and you have, um, so, uh, so a couple of things uh, that the newsbeat allows to do, it, you can do that, it has, the data science team over at Newsbeat, Choppy, have built a whole bunch of um, methods and algorithms to understand what is, a, what is the normal launch of a story for you. Mm -hmm. So it can look at a particular story and it can see if there's a large deviation from the norm. Right, it's normalized and all then, the day and then And then it looks right. where it's coming from and if it's coming from uh, Twitter, Facebook, right. Reddit, wherever it is, right. it then flags it. So they can not only change the story, but they can also go to the source of uh -huh. the sort of the where where the brush up is happening, and they can move that traffic in by understanding is are those people actually talking about the article, or is the article a counter to another piece that's mm. being talked about? You know, and how's this all being managed? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's really that's so is. cool because it really allows you as a, as a newsroom to shift your priorities in real time and your resources. So you might say, oh, this is the story we should be focusing on. Let's throw another couple heads to help develop out this story or a chain of stories along right. a certain thread. It's, it's awesome. It's really great. And we've, I, I would also say as a product development process, Tony and the team up at Chartbeat, they built Newsbeat with a bunch of news organizations. So you know, there was the Gorka guys at the outset, Forbes, New York Times, uh, Fox, there's Wall Street Journal, there's about six or seven news organizations mm -hmm. that have been sort of health heavy choppy users mm -hmm. that moved into being alpha users of Newsbeat mm -hmm. and actually helped us design the product. Uh, so, you know, the other week I was up at the journal and they have, you know, they have screens around the room, which, you know, t 18 months ago, Gorka started putting up choppy screens. But now, you know, to go to uh, in sort of a major news outlet and see, you know, the screens up there and people using it, and it's on the desktop of all of the um, of all the editors, so it's part of their workflow. That's so cool. Yeah, it's great. They even hacked together a small little thing where they used their data stream to be able to do something that they called link beat, so they could look at the Wall Street Journal page with an overlay of the number of clicks um, going to each individual piece, mm -hmm. um, which was very powerful, but also really kind of trippy for me because. That almost goes back to the very first iteration of the pre-pivot version of Choppy, mm -hmm. which was this thing called Firefly, where you could go to a web page and you'd see cursors moving around of the people on the web page, and then you could chat with them. So in a funny way, we've kind of like gone all the way back around to that original workflow that we thought would be interesting. Hmm. Um, but it's happened completely organically and working with customers and working in the workflow of, of the product. And so, I, um, so that is, yeah, lots and lots of learnings there. Um, do you want me to go through a few more? Or? Yeah, give me one more. One more. Um, I'll, I'll give you one which is very timely of today, is um, uh, right size your business in terms of financing. So we haven't talked about financing at right. all, but that's obviously some of what we do here at Betaworks. And I, uh, you know, I think it's so important what, what's happening today is we're seeing there's, big, there's price inflation happening at the seed stage mm -hmm. and at the later stage. Um, yeah, you've got to build up companies all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so if you raise around at some wild ass valuation here at the early stage, um, if, you don't, if you don't make it through the other stages, kind of screwed. you're screwed. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And, and, and you spend a year or two dealing with finance people and with, you know, doing all the things which I, I at least hate. Lawyers, bankers, trying to figure out how you can justify valuation that was. Yeah. And so, um, so right size the opportunity and don't raise, the beauty of today's market is that you can, Everybody talks about the fact that you can test and trial incredibly cheap, cheaply. There's another fact that people don't talk about much because um, I think it's disruptive to VCs, is you can actually scale businesses really cheaply today. 
And so if you go back to, if you look at Chop Beetle Bitly, those are two businesses that are sort of scaled beautifully. Bitly, last month did about 8 billion Bitly links were clicked on around the web, right? So 8 billion links were clicked on. Um, there was about six or seven uh, billion searches done on Yahoo. So admittedly, you know, it's, the, those things are apple and oranges, mm -hmm. you know, search versus a click, but they're both sort of at web scale, right? Bitly sees the web. Mm -hmm. um, Bitly has done everything it's done on less than 10 million of capital, probably less than 7 million of capital. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to raise a ton of money to get things to scale. Mm -hmm. And so, so why? Why give your company away? Why, you know, so I'm, I'm a big fan of um, raising enough money to be able to get your product into market, test and trial, and then raising enough to get to scale and not going out and raising um, you know, huge, um, huge rounds so until you know that you need it. So 30 seconds on, on a plan to do that. Keep your head count low, EC2 type, yeah. Rented machines. Yeah, everything. Virtualize, virtualize all of the infrastructure. Have your development team with you. Um, keep the business people to an absolute minimum. Um, Work out of friends, yes. shops, things like that. Yeah, and um, don't virtualize the really important stuff. In other words, in in my opinion, engineering and the the team who are building stuff. That that's not something you want to outsource. Mm -hmm. um, you want to outsource. Everything except the the, the makers, cores, yeah. right? The the creation, the right. the people who are actually creating the thing, right? So it's if it's if it's going to be an API, then you don't need a UX person. You can push that out. If right. it's a front end, if it's going to be a beautiful experience on the iPad, you need to have hardcore uh, design team, and that needs to be in house. So figure out where you know what you're doing, and and the the yep. makers of that need to be the core, and everything else can be latched onto it can be the hub and can be uh, sort of satellites around. Right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, URL pleasure. where people can go and, and check out just betaworks.com? Betaworks.com, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Good.